All right. Good morning, Heart Bay Church. For um, everyone tuning in, welcome to Talabadra Campsite, uh, where we've had the pleasure of hosting Pastor Sam and Pastor Ricky over the last few nights. Um, we're so excited for this session. It's going to be a good one. Um, church, why don't we just rise to our feet? And uh, we're going to do something a little bit different today. This week, we have a new slogan, a new motto, a new, um, oh, what, what do you call it? It's um, vision statement. That's right. So we're going we're gonna to repeat this together on the camera. Three, one, two, three. Living out the gospel together wholeheartedly. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll have to do this a few more times. Uh, but church, why don't we just prepare ourselves to just open up and receive from the Holy Spirit this morning. Amen? Amen. Oh. Listen this out together. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will see of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness You have led through the fire Darkest night, you close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. Come, we declare. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Come on I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness Running after, it's running after me with my life laid down. This is running after, it's running after the goodness of God. I'm conscious, why don't we just start praying to Him? Why don't we just declare His goodness over ourselves today? Come on, let's pray. All my life 
you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God one last time I will sing of the goodness of God amen amen how good is our God church come on I just wanted to share this new song with you this morning because I'm um, you know, I think sometimes it just becomes so easy to make it all about us. But I want to invite you, church, this morning to just meditate on the presence of God and to just start declaring His majesty, His goodness, His glory, His power, and just sit and be still in His presence. So I'm going to share this song with you. It's super easy to follow along. Sing along if you want. Just listen and receive if you prefer. But let's just worship God with all our heart today. All glory, all honor, all worship and all praise, all blessing, all power, how worthy is your name. All glory, all honor, all worship and all praise, all blessing, all power, how worthy is your name, all glory, all glory. All honor, all worship and all praise, all worship and praise, all blessing, all power, how worthy is your A 
One more time, I stand in all. I stand in all. I stand in all. I stand in all of you. we know in our heart and we believe that you always been with us but especially Lord God right now we want to invite you even more we want to increase our sensitivity to your presence Father God would you allow us to come to deep in your presence today to hear from you to hear that word of uh, assurance encouraged that you are with us and there's nothing and absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord God, for the last few days, two days. You've been just awesome, powerful to all these people, to this city, this generation. So continue to, Lord God, lead us. We we'll boldly follow our good Father. We desire to become the mature son you want us to be. We want to operate that's hard, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for this time. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's give it to God. Amen. Bye, Ella. Good morning. Good morning. Please take a seat. Please take a seat. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Happy Church. For those people here and watching from Sydney, Melbourne, and Gold Coast, Queensland. Uh, Happy Church's vision is to live out the gospel together wholeheartedly. And uh, good to see all of you. And good to see they, our common room team joined us. Let's give them a warm welcome. Woohoo! All, right. all this, uh, the, the prime school people really looking forward to hang out with you guys today. But good to have you. All right. Um, we got a lot going on. And Pastor Sam warned me, like, hey, it's going to be a long sermon. And I, and then, okay. Everybody buckle up, right? Buckle up. It's going to be good. And our people who are watching Sydney in Melbourne, it has been one of the most, I'm personally, I mean, I'm just speaking from my own personal view as well. It is such an important, timely message for this church and for me as well. Um, so please do go back to the, uh, the video and then watch it, right? But before we go any further, it's offering time, isn't it? Yeah? Okay, let's have our offering as our uh, expression of our worship. Give God one more big clap offering church. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. 
All right. Um, I heard last week we had a 10th year anniversary, right? And I heard the Queensland campus didn't really get to watch it, the video that we made in a kind of a good quality, right? So, and this time for Sydney to have the same suffering that you had, right? So we're going to show it from the, uh, the video that we've shown. I just want to celebrate once again. And there's uh, a lot of great things happening. Okay, here we go. Oh, are you ready? Our team is like, uh, are you ready to show the video? Okay, we're going to watch the video now. Let's go. I want to invite all of you to pray with us and partner with us. I really it God is it's clearly expressed and shared. Let's do that. Hello guys, how are you doing? It's Penny Snell. It's Penny Snell. I'm beginning of these. We started in a restaurant for the family. I wanted to find a church that had a vision for family and looking. I want to invite all of you to pray with us and partner with us. If God's message is clearly expressed and shared, we can truly change the city. Let's do this together. How do you guys that heartbeat church? It's been a year now. We started in a restaurant with five other families. I wanted to find a church that had a vision for families and looking very long term. Because Heart was a church plant, we tried a lot of different things. When P. Josh introduced this idea, he was very passionate about our church. And we had all these things in um, We were able to see what house church can do. Only in recent few years, been, our churches have been having this three, four, five year relationship that people are going to be friends with. In terms of what Eric was saying, we're starting to see now. It's really great. Yeah, yeah. It's been seven years for my family for joining Hope in Melbourne. It started in Michael Choi's house, a prayer gathering, and there were not many of us. And still now, there aren't that many of us, but we're growing. And most importantly, we're maturing. I think a lot about the happy journey has been about rediscovering what it means to be the church rather than just do the church. And there's been notable milestones and fruit along this journey already when we have our baptisms. I think it's a great reminder that God is truly faithful to his people and his church. Today is actually our last service in know who's heading with this is in a public venue from next week which is very exciting let's see what the uh, god in store for us um before like Heartbeat was like properly launched in Gold Coast, we used to just gather in this place. It was a fresh sort of experience for me where I could pray in English, which was much more of a comfortable language for me. There was no sort of rules or regulations of how I worship God. And you know, it was just very free. For me, I didn't want to stagnate in a system and not reach full potential. And I think Heartbeat allowed me to have freedom in doing house church also like reaching out to like the yeah. VIPs. And yeah. it, was, it was just such fun doing yeah. it. Well. In the beginning, house church, it feels like a wilderness and it feels like you're alone, you're not sure what's happening. And then out of nowhere, God just shows us the fruit. I've only been to churches where culture is already set up. The systems are already in place, specifically where Queensland is. It's a fresh start almost, trying to work around how do we progress together with God. And I think God is literally nudging us to pray so that the culture is right. And I'm just very excited and very hopeful. <laughs> for Heartbeat Church. The reason why Heartbeat was kind of struggle with the writing, which is really loving God, loving people. And it's still a struggle, which is a struggle that we experience as Christians. But it's been a joy and God's faithfulness has been evident in, in my life and in my family's life. So I'm very thankful to be part of this journey, this family we have here. Really excited to see what I was doing, like she's going to be able to Marie, I really want to see people have be able to have conversations that let them just grow discipleship, grow in encouragement, grow in questioning faith and, and go deeper. Yeah. It's been a great ride and really excited what the next 10 years has in store for Hardy Church as a whole. All right, amen, amen. <laughs> I don't know, it was not much, it's much better. Hello? Uh, than last week, but uh, yep. Wow. <laughs> the, yeah, too many echoes going on right now. Okay. Um, next up is... <laughs> okay. It's the sound because Holy Spirit is probably speaking behind me, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, we've been having a wonderful time for the last few days. Um, just cut that thing off, please. The TV off. All right. Okay. Now, I, I can't invite Pastor Ricky with this. Uh, so... 
This is the first camp we ever had two guest speaker, and both of them is rightfully uh, have a. I mean, you know, they could go to one conference on their own, and this would be a great speaker. And I never met Pastor Ricky until now. If, but when I saw him, I felt like uh, he's a brother from another mother, look like me. And I, if I'm Chinese, they would be like. <laughs> Right, uh, but I just want to hear from Pastor Ricky that he, because he's been talking to the to like our um, kids wave team, which was the hardest job. I see if someone asked me to do, I don't, I don't think I can ever, ever do it. But he's done such a great job, and I want to want him to give us a bit of rundown or brief summary of what has. Um, just before we send off to send off uh, Pastor Ricky and uh, uh, Deborah, you can bring it to me. Yeah, Deborah, you can bring it to me. <laughs> Come on, hurry up. <laughs> All right, just a little gift for you guys that are pretty prepared. Thank you. All right, pull that for them. Um, quick announcement. Um, you remember that our just 500 I said $500, all right? Um, just put it in in the happychurchau.com, uh, dot at gmail.com, and uh, we'll announce it around July, the three finalists, yeah? Okay. And, uh, and a camp is coming first and third, first to uh, third of November. This is a by yearly, all three campuses get them together, right? This is going to be a powerful time. Pastor Philip Lim from Malaysia is uh, it's going to be an exciting time for all of us. Please come and join. And for the interstate people, which is Kingsland and Melbourne, uh, the, the early bird price, right? Uh, so we, we're trying to make you guys uh, easier to, to come, come down. Okay. I try not to spend too much time because Pastor Sam said I'm going to preach long and um, this time, I don't mind him because it's, it's a kind of a, it's so important and it's, he has to concise it as much as he can. Hopefully, he writes a book. Anyway, without further ado, the man of God, Pastor Sam, let's give him the week. Oh, kiss, we can go now. You can go too. Yay! You know, the, the secret of a long sermon is it doesn't seem long, right? Amen. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Everyone's very quiet now. It's, it's, a, it's been awesome to have one of my sons, you know, Pastor Ricky here uh, with me. And so thanks for traveling out here right, all the way from Shanghai. Um, so I'm going to get right into it. We're going to talk about the um, bird in. And so hopefully you can listen to the other three messages because that basically sets up. So uh, this message is what I call kind of answering the postmodern question. Uh, you know what the postmodern question is? So what? So what? All right, you said all this stuff. So what? How does that apply to my life? And so I'm going to answer the so what. Like where do we go from here? So let's go back to what we've been doing. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. All who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. You have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, I thank you for the last service, the close of this uh, family discipleship camp, Lord. And, and we thank you for the discipleship, God, that's been taking place, Lord, with the kids, God, and with the adults here, Lord. And we're so grateful, God, to the work of the Spirit in our lives, Lord. God, to that end, we ask you right now to release the revelatory ministry of the Holy Spirit in this room. Lord, give us an ear to hear and a heart to receive what the Spirit is in each one of us, individually, corporately, as body. Lord, I humble myself today. I ask that you use me to preach your prophetic word with power and authority. Help me, Lord, not just convey your words, God, but convey your heart. God, we thank you, Lord. We love you in this house, God. And in Jesus' name, all God's people said? Amen. Okay. You know what we're doing, right? Turn to your neighbor, okay, whichever one you like better, and say, hey, good looking, serving and obeying with the heart of a son. Go ahead. You guys, come on now, right? I know you're teenagers, but... Don't be too cool, right? Because I'll embarrass you this whole service if you do. And then turn to your other neighbor and say, good looking. Leading and loving with the heart of a father. Right? 
Serving and obeying with the heart of a son, leading and loving with the heart of a father. That, that's, that's what we're going for. It's a twofold thing. It's fathers and sons. Remember, the Bible is written in a language of family. It's all about family, and we've lost that, unfortunately, for a long time. But we're trying to introduce that aspect into the church again. Remember, an orphan is someone who is fatherless or who has no identity as a son. We know you can have fathers, yet still feel very fatherless. An orphan has no significance, no inheritance, and no home. A son, on the other hand, has significance in the father's love, an inheritance from the father's hand, and a home in the father's house, now and coming in the future. The orphan heart, primarily, uh, refers to Jesus Christ, God's our father, and we know that he's our father, yet experience an internal contradiction to that belief. Deep down, they struggle to comprehend that God truly loves them. They may harbor feelings of abandonment, feelings of fear, feelings of unworthiness, and even rejection. Many times, this is due to unhealed hurts and painful past experiences. We spent the last two days highlighting and detailing uh, the condition of the orphan heart. But we get to this question, well, what do we do now? So what? And so I'm going to talk about it. It's just be an hour, okay? So just, just give me an hour of your... Talk about the antidote, the remedy, the cure. I gravitate towards this orphan nature, this orphan heart, this, this orphan heart in my life. I, I recognize these things. So what do I do about it now? And so I just have a few points, and we'll go through it. And the last one, I'm actually going to give you a prophetic word for your church. And so I'm, I'm going to close it that way, right? So number one, what do we do? First thing, receive the Father's love. You need to receive the Father's love that He has for you. Our Father, God, invites all of us to a place of unconditional acceptance. Love not based on what you do, but based on who you are. You know, there's, there's primarily four words in the Greek. There's five, but we primarily use four words of love. Some of you guys know this. Uh, phileo, which is friendship. Uh, agape, which is sort of unconditional love, this God's love. Um, there's uh, eros, which is kind of a sexual kind of love. And there's storge, which is talking about a mother's love. And so th this is in, in the Greeks, because they're much more romantic and poetic than we are. I don't have these words for it, but the, the main difference between eros and agape, they're, they're kind of the opposites of each other. Eros says, I love you because you're good looking. I love you because you're rich. I love you because you can do something for me. I love you because you have some value. And so I want to attach myself to that value. Agape is a total opposite. Agape says, I just love you, not because you have value. In fact, when God says he pours his agape love on us, he says, because I love you, you have value. There's something that's so different than that. And so we're talking about for us coming and receiving the Father's love in our lives. We talked about this yesterday, uh, Matthew 3, 16 and 17. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open. He saw the Spirit of God sending a dove and lighting on him, and behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Two significant things happen. I believe, I believe that, that if, if, if you want to really step into this place of sonship, like, like you, you really want to grow in maturity as a, a, a man and woman of God and understand your identity, these two things must happen in your life. The first one, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit needs to come upon you to say it's unconditional. Sometimes it's not something, but at the heart, at the heart of a father is unconditional love. I just, just showing our, our kids in this way. that we need, to, we need to have this, the Spirit coming upon us, and the voice of God declaring His love and approval. I've had this experience. I, I, I mentioned it yesterday. I, you know, after I, I did a 40-day fast, I came to break my fast, and, and just the, the Spirit of God just came over me. I, I, I felt, I felt uh, God's hand on my head. And it, it's a simple words. He says, Sam, you're my son. I love you. I'm so proud of you. Do whatever you want, and I'll bless you. 
And I had a little, couple different avenues and different opportunities. And no fear, no fear in making decisions. Am I going to make the right decision? Am I going to make the wrong decision? I'm so loved by God, no matter what I do, God's going to bless it. Right? He's going to bless me in a different way, right? depending on what, which, which road I choose. But He's just going to bless it. And I, I got up from that place, I was totally changed. I got up finally knowing who I am. I am a child of God. It's powerful. In John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus says, You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's not really the truth that sets you free. It's the truth that you know. The word know in Greek and in Hebrew actually have the same connotation. The word know in Greek is the word genosko. Uh, in Hebrew, it's the word yada. It, they both mean the same thing. It's not book knowledge. It's knowledge gained by experience. It's something happens to you in this way. See, most, most Christianity, most seminary, most things you learn in the church, we're so into cognitive knowledge. It's so into book learning in this way. That's not the way the Bible is written. Right? The Bible is written when he says, you, if you know, you shall know, you shall experience the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's, 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 that's not head knowledge. It's heart knowledge. It's been said the greatest distance in the world is at 12 inches from your head to your heart. But this is where it goes. I always give this illustration, right? Let's say, let's say just by, uh, uh, by just a, an act of God, right, that Pastor Josh and Yuna are going to have another child, right? The two ones are grown up, right? So, you know, they're already out of the house soon. So they want to have another child, right? This, don't be shocked, okay? <laughs> and so, you know, so they get ready. So they go to the bedroom that night. We're all adults here. Right? They get very clean and they shower. And so they sit on the bed. And this is, this is most, most times with the Christianity, they think they're going to sit on the bed, they're going to hold hands, and they're going to think about a child. They're going to think really hard. You guys want another boy or girl? Uh, girl, okay. <laughs> so, so they're going to they're gonna sit, they're gonna sit at home on the bed, ready, they're ready to roll, man. And they're going to hold hands. And what are they going to do? Girl. Mm, girl. We want a girl. Girl, 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 girl. Will they ever have a baby? Thinking about a baby? No way. Impossible. Right? Unless you're the second coming of Mary. Right? <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's like, your kids are really disgusted right now, by the way. <laughs> but, but that's, you get what I'm saying, Right? And look, the Old Testament, Genesis, it said, Adam knew Eve, Yada, and conceived a child. It wasn't head knowledge, right? It wasn't they just sat and thought about a child and it happened. They, had, they experienced one another, Adam and Eve. That's how you have kids. I just gave you sex ed. You don't need sex ed now anymore in school. That, that's, that's, that's basically how it works. You understand? But yet, we, a lot of times we think, knowledge, I need to know God, and so I just need to study, and I need to read. That's part of it. But genosko yada means the same thing. It's knowledge gained by experience. Some of you guys want to be fit. You don't get fit by reading an exercise book. You know what I mean? You don't get fit by watching YouTubes of other people doing exercise. You get fit by doing it. Do you understand? That's how to know God. And we've reduced, it's so sad. In, uh, I'm talking about the church in America, right? And, and I mean, in Hong Kong, I'm familiar with, with those kind of churches. I don't know about Australia, but we reduce God to doctrine. We reduce God to ideas. We reduce God to postulates instead of experiencing the living God. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is what I had an encounter with the truth. And the truth is not a concept. The truth is a person. His name is Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
You know by, you know by experience. is Jesus. Our Father invites us, every single one of us, to a welcome embrace. He invites us to belong to a family, His family. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. Think about it. He knew that we're operating in the orphan heart. And so He predestined us even before time. He predestined us to this place of adoption that we become sons and daughters, right, through what Jesus Christ has done. And so receive the Father's unconditional love and approval. Number two, receive your identity in Christ. You are now in Christ. The Father now invites us to receive our unique God-given identity. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name. See, in Christ, we are perfect. Did you know that? You know, in Christ, did you know that you're perfect? Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, good looking. He says, you are perfect. In Christ. You understand? When we're in Christ, we embody everything that Christ is about. And so we, we, we need to understand our, who we are in the Lord. And see, I, I, I know my identity. Right? I, I, I know who I am. I'm a child of God, right? I told you the other day, this is the greatest truth that you'll probably hear throughout this time. I am God's favorite son. Right? And like I said, you should all feel the exact same way, that you are God's favorite because you are. You are. And, and this, is, this is a reality. We're totally righteous, every single one of us, not because of what I do, but because of who I am in Christ. Is because what Jesus Christ has done for us. Right? Earlier I quoted Tim Keller, the gospel is not about what we do. The gospel is about what Jesus Christ has already done for us. This is the doctrine of justification. Just as if I had never sinned. You know, when we come to, to, uh, to the day of judgment, which actually will pass, but because we'll, we'll, it'll pass over us, and what's going to happen, it's like a courtroom drama. And there's going to be Satan, and he's the accuser of the brethren. He's going to accuse us. And then there's going to be our advocate. The Holy Spirit is going to be there. Right? And the judge is going to be right, God. And the, 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 the devil is going to, I don't know if he's going to play a videotape, but he's going to list off all these things that we did wrong. All these sins that we had. All the thoughts and intentions where he says everything will be known. He's going to do all these things. And then the judge is going to render a judgment. And you know what he's going to say? Bang! Innocent. You know why? Because he's not going to look through us through the lens of our sin. Jesus Christ is going to stand right before us, right? And because of his sacrifice, we are totally innocent. Actually, totally sinless. Can you imagine that? At the judgment seat, that's why we pass over judgment. We're going to be totally sinless. Because what the, the devil's going to, and everything he's going to say is true. Yeah, we did this. Oh, yeah, we did that. We thought that. All true. But you know what's going to happen? We are seen through the eyes of Christ and what Christ has done. Totally righteous. Totally sinless before the Lord. And we pass over judgment. That's the doctrine of justification. Right? We, we so need to... to to, to bring that back to life is such a powerful word. It's what launched the Reformation. All right, this is Luther's you know, thesis that he, that, he, that he nailed to the door of Wittenberg. This is, this is what so this was all about. It's, it's, we got to understand who we are in Christ. We're justified, not because of what we've done. We've justified because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Our identity is in Christ. And it has an effect. You know, some people can say things about me. I don't care. Uh, you know what I mean? And stuff because, why, I mean, why do I care about this feeble human being's thoughts about me when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords 
He says, Sam is awesome. Right? Sam is my son. He's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. Why do I care what anyone else thinks? You know, on social media or whatever it may be. The king of kings, I know his thoughts. I, I understand what he's saying. It changes the way that you live your life. You no longer try to please other people, right? which, which actually is a, is a never-ending game. You can never please the crowd enough. Instead, we end up pleasing God and Him alone. It changes. right? You receive your God-given identity in Christ as a child of God. Right? Turn to yourself. I don't know if you can do this. Just put your finger, you know, and just, so you're basically staring at yourself, okay? You understand, you know, turn your eyes in, just stare at yourself and say, hey, good looking, talk to yourself. I'm a child of God. That's my identity. I would say, you, you get that in your spirit, that will change your life. I'm serious. You let those words sink in deep in your spirit, that will change your life. Number three, learn to walk in submission. Learn to walk in submission. Hebrews 13, 17. Submit and obey your leaders in a way that brings them joy instead of grief, as this will be unprofitable for you. Obey your leaders. Submit to them. You know, years ago, I visited. We we also have a small groups ministry, and we call them house churches as well. And so I visited a house church one time, and the topic of submission came up. And I, I told these guys this. I said, you know what, to be honest, it's good for your soul that you learn how to submit. It really is. It's really good for your soul. It's good for me, even as a senior pastor, to listen to other people, to submit to them. It's part of a discipleship process. Um, one of the things that our church members like, like to do is they like to invite me to meals with their like, people they're dating. Right? They want me to check them out. And uh, uh, they, you know, they, they, want, they want my, my kind of seal of approval. Right? I don't really say much unless it's like, really bad. And I say, break up with this guy, man. Right? This guy's a loser. Don't, don't, don't even you know, go any further. You're going to waste your time. And so, but, but I very rarely do that. I, I understand the power that I have. And so I, I try to use it in, in as much humility as I can. And so, but uh, uh, it was, we had a, a, a lady, and she uh, invited her boyfriend. Uh, he's, you know, a white guy, uh, lives in Europe. So he's, you know, here is on a trip. And we start talking, and he's, very, he's a very spiritual guy. You know what I mean? Like, he believes in everything. And so we're, we're, just, we're just talking and things, and, you know, and he's, he's like, oh, yeah, you know, I, 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 I believe in Jesus, you know, and I, 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 I take some from Buddha, Right. And, uh, you know, I, I do some Zoroastrianism, you know, and, and, and he's just like, he's, and he, but he's very spiritual. And, and he, t- he turns to me and he says, you know, I, I, I understand what you're doing. I mean, someone to a pastor. I understand what you're doing, he says, but I hate organized religion. And I turned to him and I said, oh, man, you know what? I love organized religion. I know, I'm not saying that as a pastor. I love organized religion. You know why? I told him, I said, because it's good for me to obey something. It's good for me to have an authority in my life, the scriptures. And I turned to this guy and I said, hey, buddy, let me tell you something. If you, if you are the sole arbiter of what you believe, you take from Jesus, you take from Muhammad, you take from Siddhartha, right? you take from Zoroastrian, you, you take from all these things. If you are the sole arbiter of your belief in your quest to find God, you are God. You're the one who decides what to believe. You're the one who decides this and that. You are actually God. You don't need to search for God because you are God. And his face just dropped. He knew I was dropping truth on him. Right? I mean, he, I mean seriously, his, you can see his count because he was kind of like a little arrogant. I'm so spiritual. Right? I, I believe in it. I, I just take from all. I said, hey, buddy, you're God actually. And just the logic just, you could tell he was shaken. Started coming to church, right? No, I mean, there's, there's, some, there's a lot of people like that. There's people like that in the church. I'm going to talk about that some more, right, in, in, during this time. But you need to, you need to learn. It's, it's just, it's good for me. It's good for me to listen to somebody else. It's good for me to, you know, when I, when I was in seminary, my, my, my pastor also went to Fuller. And so 
Um, so we, we have a lot of the same professors and stuff, and he's asked me what classes you're taking, and I was like, well, you know, I, I, I took this, I really like this guy, and I, I took this one here, and then this one, I, I don't really like this, you know, and I, I don't want to do this, and I, I just want to study this and this. Pastor goes, you're so wise. He looked at me, and you know, then he got very stern, right? He said, Sam, it's not the classes that you want to take that will benefit you. It's the classes you don't want to take. I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> all right. So I signed up for all these hard classes. You know that, but you know what? It was best for my soul. It was good for my soul. You got to understand, the, the, the battle, I said, the heart of the orphan heart is self. If you only do what you want to do, how will you ever follow Jesus? <laughs> right? If you only, if, you, if your whole life you just do what you, in other words, your life is centered on self. It's you and only you. You're the arbiter of your faith. You're the arbiter of everything you want to do. However will you succeed in this life? You're going to become the biggest narcissist. You're going to think the whole world evolves around you. It's unbelievable. That, that's what happens. That's why we have such selfish Christians in the church today because it's all about them. Listen, it's good for my soul to do things I don't want to do because when I do that, I crucify the self. Remember C.S. Lewis in his quote in the Screw Tape Letters? He talks about pride to self, the ruthless, sleepless, unsmiling concentration on self that is the mark of hell. How do we know this? I didn't put it on here. Matthew 16, 23. Jesus tells the disciples, this is powerful. Jesus tells the disciples that he's going to die, he's going to be raised from the dead, right? He's going to be thrown into the hands of the, the leaders and he's going to suffer. And Peter, Peter takes him aside and says, Jesus, and Peter, I mean, Peter rebukes Jesus. He rebukes his rabbi. And he says, Jesus, you shouldn't be saying those kinds of things. Come on, no, 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 stop kidding around. And remember what Jesus told him? Jesus looked at his star disciple. And he looked at him and he says, Get behind me, Satan. Oh, oh my, can you, I mean, he called Peter Satan. He says, Get behind me, Satan. Why? For you're not sitting your, man, your mind on God's interests, but man's. You know what is satanic? You know what is demonic? Self. That's, that's exactly, isn't that exactly what Jesus said? He says, get behind me, Satan. He's not, he's not calling Peter Satan. He's talking about the spirit that's operating in Peter when he says those things. And he says, get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on God's interest, God-centered. You're setting your mind on man's interest, self-centered. You know, you know the antidote to get out of self? Submission. Sub two words, sub, under, mission. Someone else's mission. Come under someone else's mission. It's, 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 it's so simple in this way. Right? It's, listen, it's good for you to do things that you don't want to do. Right? How many of you guys would pay taxes if you didn't have to? Yeah, none of us. But it's good for your government. It's good for your social services that you guys do this. How many of you guys would obey the speed limit if you didn't have to? You know what I mean? Some of you guys don't? Hey Amen. Drive safe, dude. <laughs> right? Dangerous. It's okay. I was your age once. I know that's like. What is something? When you deny self, Right? When you learn to submit, it's, it's part of the maturing process. It's part of the discipleship process. The problem, I'll tell you, the problem with this generation, right? I'll tell you, right? The problem with this generation is you're so much into feelings, right? I just don't feel like it. Now it's like, I mean, excuse me, right? I feel like I'm a woman. What? Right? I feel like I'm this. I feel like, what? feelings don't matter. Okay, okay. Feelings matter. <laughs> All right, I should rephrase this. Don't, I'm, not, I'm not heartless. Feelings matter, but it's not truth. 
Just because you feel like it doesn't mean it's so. Listen, I, I'm, I'm married. I've been married for, for uh, almost 22 years. Many times, I don't feel like listening to my wife, man. <laughs> but I do because it's good for my soul. <laughs> it's good for peace in my household. Sometimes I don't feel like going to work. Many times I often feel I don't feel like going to work. But it's good for my soul that I do, as well as my bank account, right? And putting food on the table for my kids and all these things. You know, my kids in the morning, I don't feel like going to school. Tough. You know, I mean, if we lived our life primarily based on our feelings, nothing would get done in this world. Absolutely nothing would get done. And it says it's not all about these feelings. And I don't feel like, I don't feel this, I don't feel that. We're so driven by these feelings, sometimes, sometimes, you need to stop focusing on your feelings. And you need to learn just to walk in obedience and submission. Put yourself under someone else or something else. Primarily in this context, we're talking about the church. In your family, we're talking about your family unit. Right? In work, we're talking about your work. I mean, is, you, you, you understand, submission, coming under someone else is inlaid. There, there's, there's God has a discipleship process. It's called life. You don't just have to take a discipleship class if you really understand how God raises people up. So think about this. You get, you're born, and what's the first thing you need to do? You need to learn to obey and submit to your parents. Your parents says, don't touch that stove. You better not touch that stove when it's on. You're going to burn your hand. My right, parents tell you, don't cross the street without looking right, right, left and right, or else you're going to get hit by a car. You automatically learn to submit when you're a child. And then you go to school, and you learn to submit and obey your teacher. If you don't do that, you get bad grades and you fail. You know what I mean? And then you get into the workplace, and it's the same thing. Then you learn to submit and obey your bosses. If you don't do that, you don't get promoted. I mean, you, you got you to understand, life is a discipleship process. And then the big one, you get married. Oh my gosh. And then you got to submit right, to your wife. Remember, it's mutual submission. And if you don't do that, man, it's, it's not a happy home. And then you do that for a while and you feel like you're pretty good. And then you have kids. Oh, kids, then both people have to die. You know what I mean? Both need to submit, you know, for this little baby. I mean, it's, this, is, this is discipleship. God inlays discipleship primary to living life and every stage in order for you to excel in order for you to succeed you need to learn to submit and be obedient why does god do that because it's inlaid in the scriptures that's how people grow you don't just do what you want it's good for your soul to be able to do this right and some of you guys haven't figured that out yet because you're still doing everything on your own no wonder you're not growing right no wonder you become bitter Things just don't work out. And you're, it's because your whole life was about you. And then something needs to change. We need to learn to submit. Uh, years ago, and so people say, well, you know, Pastor Sam, you know, I, I, I want to do that, but I'm, I'm just not feeling it. You know, I, 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 want my, I want to be led by my heart. I say, bull crap, man. Right? That's a bunch of bull. That's just one of those excuses. I remember... Um, one of our girls, uh, you know, she had just graduated. She was a banker, and she had a boyfriend, right, who was still back in New York. Or they were students at Columbia together, and he came for uh, for a Christmas holiday. So he's one year younger than than our church member, and so of course, you know, my church member wanted me to have lunch with him, and so I sat and had lunch. And he's he's not a Christian, uh, but but he's a really good guy, nice guy, and I sat with him, and he just said like I just. I, like, I want to believe because I know this is really important to my girlfriend, but I just, just don't feel it, you know? And I said the same thing. I said, hogwash, man. And I said, do, simply do this because we're starting a fast. We, we, I, our church, January 2nd, every year, we, I, I leave my church on a 20-day fast. And so we, we go through this fast together, and, I, and we have early morning prayer every morning during this fast. And so they come together, and I said, hey, do this, man. I know you're not feeling it and stuff, but put your commitment first. Just, just, just obey. Just, you know, just, just submit under this, and God will change your heart in the process. And so this guy, right, has, you know, hardly ever gone to church. Uh, he, that's what he did. Me and him were the, were the two ones were early every single morning. 
He came every single morning, 7 a.m., and he fasted. He did anything, just like the rest of us. Right? Uh, he, he was probably maybe 15 days. Every morning he showed up. You know, before the 15 days were over, he gave his life to Jesus. I mean, it's just, just let your commitment, submit. Just, okay. I asked him, do you trust me? He goes, no, it's okay. You, 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 it's good, that's a good answer, right? Because you don't know me. But just trust me on this. If I fail you, if I fail you in this, don't, don't ever listen to anything I ever say in, in your life. But trust me on this. You just come and you show up. You submit, just commit, just for this little time, and watch what God does to your heart. That's what he did. He denied himself, right? He crucified his flesh, and he came every... I was impressed with this guy. He came every single morning. And stuff. And even like during the midway, I turned to the girl, I said, this guy's a good guy. He's a keeper, right? He's going he's gonna to find Christ very soon. I had the privilege of doing their wedding in New York, right? They have three beautiful kids. Uh, you know, actually some of the kids named after our kids, right? Uh, um, and uh, uh, she actually left banking, became a doctor. I mean, this is a crazy woman, right? And stuff. And he, he's, he's like, this guy's bad to the bone, man. I mean, man of God. Where before she was kind of the spiritual leader, and this guy went a whole nother level. And just simply because, it was so simple, he just submitted. He says, this doesn't make sense. I've never fasted in my life. I don't even wake up early in the morning, right? But okay, I'm going to try this out. And God so touched his heart. I, I, I love meeting with these guys every, every time I go out uh, to New York. It's just incredible, just the, the story that happens there. Brothers and sisters, learn to submit. Learn to walk in submission to your parents first, right? To your bosses, to your pastors, your shepherd leaders. Learn to submit. It's good for your soul. God does something to you when you follow God's order in this way. Number four, Learn to walk together where I put that? at heartbeat. There you go. Right? Learn to walk together at heartbeat. See, our Father invites us to walk together in family, in community. He places us uniquely in the body of the local church. 1 Corinthians 12, 18, But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as He desired. In other words, it's not a mistake that you're here right now. It's not a mistake that you're part of this church. He predestined this to happen. Right? He arranges you guys in this body. Henry Blackaby, a uh, guy that did exp wrote Experience in God, this is what he says. He says, Christians think their walk with God is independent of anyone else, and they're not accountable to the church. These are, these are what we call the Lone Ranger Christians. Actually, do you know what a Lone Ranger is? It's a very American idiom. It's an old Western. You know, Lone Ranger is just a guy who's always on their own, right? It's kind of the American rugged individualism, you know, my way. It's, 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 it's rubbish, right? It's not Christian by any means. I mean, let me just read some scriptures. Matthew 18. We, we totally misuse this verse. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to teach it correctly. Matthew 18, 20. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth should be bound in heaven, Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Most people use this and say, oh, they use it for prayer meeting. We get to a prayer meeting, oh, there's two or three gathered, Lord, your presence is here. Did you know that's not the context? You know the context of Matthew, what it is? It's church discipline. Jesus is saying, when you are operating in church discipline, he says, my presence is there with you. Okay, yes. When you're praying, his presence is there too. You guys understand me, right? But the context of the text in Matthew is church discipline. That's how much his presence comes. It's, it's community. It's, it's, it's when the church is, is representing God correctly and correcting the members of his church. And he says, and if you agree on anything, he says, it will be done. And Jesus says, and I'll be there with you. It's church discipline. It's not just a prayer meeting. I think we often misuse, 
Again, of course, when you're there, Jesus is there as well. But understand the context very carefully. Jesus is giving power to the church so much that he promises to be present when it's being carried out. See, some people have overemphasized the priesthood of all believers to the detriment of our corporate identity. Yes, we're all priests, but we also have a corporate identity. And I feel like this is the major error that we run into. And I'll explain it simply this way. There's something called the Christian faith. The Christian faith is personal. Christian faith is just you and God, nobody else. The Christian life, on the other hand, is something very, very different. So Christian faith, this is what I believe, right? This is the scriptures. This is, this is your personal, right? It's just you and God. Christian faith, Christian life is you, God, and everybody else. Many people, they confuse Christian life with Christian faith. And they basically say, I don't need anybody else. No, you need everybody else. This is in the Bible, one another's in the scriptures that Paul talks about. Love one another. Bear one another's burdens. Right? Pray for one another. Uh, uh, submit to one another. Forgive one another. These, there, there's, there's almost a hundred one another's in, in the Pauline epistles that deal with living the Christian life. We have a Christian faith, personal, me and God, nobody else. But the Christian life is me, God, and everybody else. I think we confuse those two things. Don't confuse them. We need one another. 1 John 1, 3. What we have seen and heard and proclaimed to you also that you too may have fellowship. Fellowship simply means sharing. Fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. The believer says that I don't need anybody else. I just have fellowship with God has not read the Bible. Because he says, have fellowship with us. And also, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Christians enter a fellowship that goes two ways. With God and then with other Christians. Right? So, peace Sam. How about the Christians that claim that claim I belong to the universal church. I don't go to church because I belong to the universal church. Bull, right? That's, a bunch of, that's a load of crap, man. It, it, in, in the biblical record, does not exist. Here's theologian Andy Stib, Alan Stibbs. He says this. Any idea or enjoying salvation or being a Christian in isolation is foreign in the New Testament writings. Doesn't exist. The New Testament gives no samples of Christians who belong to the universal church but have no link with the local church. Think about this. It's illogical, right, to to basically uh, uh, say that you are a part of the worldwide universal church yet refuse to gather with a segment of that universal church that exists in your geographical area. Why do people say garbage like that? It's because they want to choose whatever they want. They don't want to come under submission to any leadership. And we have people like that. There's guys, I mean, there's literally guys I know. They, they, come, they, they come to church. They come to our service. Um, uh, you know, we have two services every Sunday. They come after the worship. And they come right away. And I, and I talk to them. I say, why do you come so late all the time? He says, oh, morning, I'm leading worship in another church. I'm like, what the, what? He says, but, 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 but I don't like the guy's sermons. So I come to SP because I like your sermons, thinking that he was going to flatter me. And I say, get the hell out, man. Right? This is, well, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Does your pastor know that you're coming here to listen to the sermons? You know, and he just didn't say anything. I said, how are you on the worship team? Like, how is that possible? And then he told me, then he goes to another house church and another church because he likes it there. Right? And then he goes to this. And he's, so, so he's... I'm, I'm part of the universal church, baby. Actually, you're part of no church. You, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, 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 such, it, it's such a cop-out. It's just, I get to, I'm going to choose this, I'm going to choose that, I'm going to choose this, I get to choose this. You're God. You are the sole arbiter of your faith. Not the scriptures. Not any other leadership. You're under submission to nobody. You, you know what I mean? I mean, this is crazy. Think about this. 
It's, it's like claiming that you have a car. I own a car, right? But the engine is in Sydney. You know what I mean? You know, the, 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 the tires are in Adelaide, right? You know, and, and you know, the, 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 the seats, right, are in Sydney. Did I say Sydney already? Okay, uh, Melbourne. Okay, Melbourne. Uh, sorry, I don't know too many cities here. Do you have a car? No. You know what you have? You have an inventory for a junkyard. That's basically what you have. But there's so many people because they don't want to come under submission to the local church. The scriptures are all about the local church. Listen, yes, we are all part of the universal church. Let me, let me quote Blackaby again. This is what he says. All believers worldwide are united in the kingdom of God under the rule of the king. But the local church is to function like a body. Yeah, I'm sure you know people that hop around. They come here, they come there. They, yeah, it's, they, I mean, they're doing the devil a favor, man. You know what I mean? And you'll tell you, they're, they're not going to grow. It's just, it's just not going to happen in this way. And so this is what I would say to you. Be committed to the house of God here at Heartbeat. Be committed to the house of God. Be fathered by the teachings in this house and learn to walk as a son. Listen, you can, learn, you can listen to other sermons. I, listen, I, I don't discourage any of our people. I mean, our people you know, are part of BSF. You know, they, they, they do all, you know, Bible study fellowship. They do all kinds. I, I never discourage them because we are part of the body of Christ, right? But you better well be listening to the sermons here at this church. In fact, in, in our church, you know, in our house churches, we have a rule. Because a lot of our guys travel a lot, and, and, you know, for work and stuff, and they manage. So all, all, you know, all my notes, we, we are video, we're a podcast. I mean, we, our team does a pretty good job, media job, of putting everything out there. And so every week, you, people have my sermon notes. I mean, the little ones that I use, we put, post it online. They, they have all the videos, even podcasts, everything. And so if you come to a house church that week, and you did not listen to the sermon, you cannot speak. That's our rule. No listen, no speak. It's very simple. You know why we do that? Because people don't listen. They come in, they ask the dumbest questions. <laughs> they waste everybody's time. You know, because they hear something, but it's not what I said. You know what I mean? And they're like, oh, I can't believe Sam said that. And they waste 15 minutes trying to explain, right? And then we realize, let's not waste time. If you don't listen to the sermon, don't speak. You can still come. You can still eat. You can do everything. You can do, you can do everything, right? You can listen to everyone, the comments. But you, shh, be quiet. You have not earned the right to speak because you did not do what you're supposed to do to be part of this community that sacrifices and meets, right, once a week in the evenings or in the mornings. You have not earned that right to say anything because you did not do what you should have done to be part of this family and this community. Does it sound harsh? No. It's good for their soul. Because guess what? Next week, they better, they're going to go listen to the message. Because they, you know, this, they always want to say something. Right? They, everyone has an opinion and stuff. But no, nope. no listen, no speak. And it's, it blesses everybody else. Because then they don't have to spend 15, 20 minutes trying to explain the sermon to this guy. It's like, come on, man. Right? Figure it out. You just were lazy. It's, 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 uh, it's amazing how the church accommodates laziness. We accommodate, right, disobedience. We, we accommodate tardiness. We're so, I mean, I don't, we're, supposed church, we're supposed to be nice, but we're not doing them any favors by doing that. Right? We're not doing anyone any favors by doing that. And so be committed to the house of God here at Heartbeat. Right? Be fathered by the teachings and learn to walk as a mature son. Give yourself to the local church, this church. And look, and if you, wanna, if you don't want to do that, like, like I always say this, and people always misquote me, okay? If this is not a church that you want to give to, that you want to serve in, that you want to invite your friends to, go somewhere else. You know what I mean? You're not doing anyone any favors by staying here. 
Because every single believer, you deserve to be part of a local church that you want to give to, that you want to serve in, that you want to invite your friends to, that you want your kids to be raised up. You deserve that as a child of God. Every single one of you deserves this. And if this is not it, go find it. Go find that place that you want to sow everything into. That's what the church is about. And if this is not it, leave. Please leave. Now, I also often get misquoted because people just focus on the leave. <laughs> oh, peace, I'm just kicking everyone out of the church. Listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> I said, just listen to what I'm saying. They don't listen. They just hear what they want to hear, and they complain. But if they really listen, I'm, this is for your benefit. I'm, it's not for my benefit. It's for your benefit. You deserve to be part of a body that you want to sow your life into. If this ain't it, go find it. Because yeah, that church is out there for you somewhere. Right? But if you're here at Heartbeat, come on church, right? come on Heartbeat. If this is your church, man, you sow into this place. Right? Be fathered by the messages in this house. Give yourself to the local church. 1 John 3, 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we will be called children of God, and such we are. I mean, it's crazy. Now, okay, those are my points. Let me finish with the prophetic word, okay? But I'm going to finish with a story. I've been going through this narrative. I actually finished this series, and it wasn't until months, months later. Actually, I was traveling somewhere, and I, I think I was in the U.S. I was, I was speaking at, at, at some conference, and man, this, this hit me like a lightning bolt. And I, I, I found it. Because I was always looking at the scriptures. I was, through this narrative, I was trying to find a passage where the Father is loving and leading radically and where the Son was serving and obeying radically. Like, like those two things. I always found one thing and I found nothing, but a passage that has both of them together, I found it. I found it. It's Genesis chapter 22. Let's read this together. Genesis chapter 22. The offering of Isaac, right? The Quran actually says the offering of Ishmael. They're wrong. It's the offering of Isaac. Look what it says. Now it came about, Genesis 22, verse 1. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering to one of the mountains of which I tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go yonder and we will worship and return to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac his son, and he took his hand to the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them walked on together. And then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Um, we'll, we'll, okay, we'll stop there. Now, the key, many, many people will misunderstand Genesis 22. The key to understanding Genesis 22 is actually the first line. Now it came about after these things. When I first became a Christian and I, I read Genesis 22, I was scared to death. I wanted to have kids, and I thought, oh my goodness, if I have a kid, God's going to ask me to kill my son. That is literally what I thought, because I read this. I just read it very plain, and I didn't understand after these things. See, this, is not, this, is a kind of, this kind of story is not for the immature, the young Christian. 
This is for the actually very, very mature Christian. What are after these things? This simply, Abraham enjoyed such an incredible life with God that God could ask Abraham to sacrifice his son. I'll give you a little context. Do you remember when you first got saved? And when I first got saved, one of the things I said was, I don't know why, we always think of this. I said, well, if I get saved, Lord, please don't send me to Africa. I don't know why. I've been to Africa. Africa is beautiful, actually. But, but we stick there, right? It's like, oh, Lord, please don't send me to Africa. You know, like, kind of, <laughs> send me to Hawaii instead. <laughs> or, or we try to be smarter than God. and say, Lord, don't ever send me to Hawaii. You know, I, you guys understand what I'm saying, right? <laughs> and we think we're going to trick God. With the, uh, we're, so, we're so dumb many times. But Abraham has such a life with God. In that way, now I've been a Christian for, gosh, what? I got saved in 1992. All right, it's been a little while. You know, if God were to ask me to go to Africa, I would say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. In a heartbeat. Lord, whatever you want, I'll go. You, you guys don't know what I mean? You know, when you're young, it's like, oh, don't, don't, Lord, I, don't, don't, all these things. And then as you mature in the Lord, you're ready to roll. Yes, sir. Send me. Here am I, Lord. And we, we change. We mature. Abraham, he says, after these things. Remember, Abraham lied and God rescued him. And then he lied again, and God rescued him again. You know, and, and, and Abraham, he starts off the journey in disobedience, right? God says, leave your family, leave your land, go to the land I'll show you. And what does he do? He takes his nephew with him. I mean, just, and he learned that those were these things that happened. And every time, God came through for him. So he trusted God, right? This is not for the, the young believer. He's talking about a mature man of God. This guy that had a, had a, a life with God. And so what God said, okay, you're, take your son, your only son. And he said, yes, sir. He woke up early in the morning to obey the Lord. Uh, this, is, this is amazing. This is what happens. And so he, he, spent this, he experienced the goodness of God so much that God can ask him anything. Brothers and sisters, are you at a point in your life, can God ask you to do anything and you would obey Huh? It's a harsh question. God can ask you anything. And you say, yes, sir. And you would obey immediately. Let me, let me just drop some gold on you right now. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Abraham obeys immediately. Wakes up early in the morning and he goes, See? Uh, verse 5, or Genesis 22, 5, it says, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I, the lad, will go, go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Abraham had such a life in God, such a history with God. He knew even if he were to sacrifice his son, he believed that God would raise him from the dead. That's why he said, yes, sir. Because he, he says it here. He says, you guys stay, and it's good. You know why he let them stay? Because if, if, if Abraham were to try to, his men would try to stop him. Thinking, old man has gone senile. You know what I mean? And so he leaves them and he says, we will, listen, we will go worship and return. He knew. He knew he was supposed to sacrifice his son. He said, but we're going to both return. You see that? He had faith. He knew even if he slayed his son, God would raise him from the dead. That's the kind of life that he had with God. Right? That, that's why he asked him to do He's not going to ask you to sacrifice your kid. Come on! Don't be ridiculous. He may ask you to sacrifice your child in a different way. You know what I mean? He's not going to ask you to kill your kid. It's, it's, you have to understand the, the context that's happening here. Right? This is not a, a, a question for new believers, as we often think, right? But it's to really understand this story is about metaphor and symbolism. It's metaphor and symbolism. Isaac, let me just teach for two minutes here. Isaac is what we call a type of Christ. He's, he's basically um, a, a sign of what's to come. Isaac is a type of Christ. I'll show you, right? Isaac, he is... And Jesus, they're both of them, they're the only son of promise. 
God's only begotten, Abraham's right, promised son. They both carry wood on their back up to Mount Moriah, Calvary. It's the same mountain, same exact mountain, right? So Mount Moriah is Calvary, you know, or, or, or Golgotha, or wherever you say it in this way, right? So he carries wood on his back up the mountain. That's what Jesus did. That's what Isaac does. Same mountain, Mount Moriah, Calvary. It's the same mountain. Now, this one, okay, I, I don't know, right? I don't know about this. But Adam Clark, a very renowned theologian, he contends that, that Isaac was 33 years old. I don't think so, right? So that, that's why I just, I just, you know, I can be honest with you guys. I don't think, I, I, thought, I think he was much younger. And, and most scholars are kind of in that camp that, that he's probably in his teens, maybe around 15 to 20, you know, uh, right in that ballpark. Um, think about it. Both the father and Abraham considered, they were considered dead by their father for three days. When Abraham is journeying right to the mountain, he's already thinking his son is dead. Same faith, same as the father. They both submitted him, themselves willingly to the father. And both were raised from the altar, their life spared by the power of God. Right? One, right, spared the other one, resurrection. Right? That's pretty amazing, right? This symbolism, this metaphor that's taking place, right? Like I said, God will never ask you to literally kill your child. He may ask you to sacrifice your child in other ways, but you know this story? God was demonstrating what he was willing to do. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? He was demonstrating what he was going to do and what he was willing to do. Right? God is so misunderstood in this passage the, to the casual observer. So is Abraham. Listen, leaders will very often be easily misunderstood, especially in a season, in a time, in a culture where there's so much suspicion of authority figures. I am so easily misunderstood so many times. But you know what? I'm not here to be understood. I'm here to obey the Lord. That, that, that's, that's, that's my call. Let me, let me just drop this in your spirit just a little bit. All right? it's, it's, you, you, you're going to have to chew on this a little bit. Abraham obeyed God so radically that it upset his wife, Sarah. Right? If you read the passage very carefully, afterwards, actually, you know, um, Isaac doesn't go home with Abraham. Isaac goes home to his mom, probably saying, you know, your father tried to kill me. The story says that Sarah moved, actually. She ends up living in Hebron, and, Isaac moved, or, and Abraham moved to Beersheba. Right? I mean, they, they, they were separated for a little. I mean, this is, this is Jewish tradition, right? That they were separated for a bit because Sarah was so angry. That's what the Jewish tradition says. So angry at Abraham for taking the son, the only son, and trying to sacrifice him. I mean, this is, this is crazy. And, and so all, all, I say, all I want to say in this is at some point in your journey as a church, Pastor Josh's obedience to God will offend you. It will offend you. In the journey of my church, my obedience to the Lord has, has, will, has offended people. They get really upset. You know, to be honest, the best sons that are in our house are the ones that were offended by me at some point. Right? P. Sam, why are you doing this? P. Sam, why, why do we keep sending out our leaders and plant other churches? Don't you know we have needs here in Hong Kong? P. Sam, why are you traveling so much? Why are you visiting these? Don't you know we have a church? You know what I tell them? Share. Learn to share. It's not all about you. Don't just focus on yourself. Right? We have a world to win for Christ. You're setting your mind on man's interests instead of God's. Back in the days, you used to work. Now, people are too sophisticated. Right? And they want to keep arguing, so on and so forth. But it's, it's, it's the heart. I'm telling you, some point in your journey, though your leader's heart to obey God 
is going to offend you. You're going you're to totally misunderstand your shepherds. You're going to misunderstand your pastors. You're going to miss. It is, it is inevitable that's going to happen. Abraham was so mi even misunderstood by his wife in this way, and it caused some turmoil. Right? Obviously, you know they, they got back together and all these things. It is inevitable. It's inevitable at some point in this life you're going to be offended. You know why? Because you have a flesh. You have a flesh. That's why Paul says, right? He says, I am crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Right? That, 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 this is the heart of it. Obedience and submission. So the leadership and love of the Father and the submission and obedience of the Son. Listen, the Son, let me talk about sonship for a bit. The Son, he, he's no dummy, right? He's walking up the mountain, Right, you know, they got the knife, they got the rope, right, which they tie the animal through, right? They got the wood for the fire. They're walking up, and his son says it. And he says, Father. And he says, what, son? He says, I see the wood. I see the rope. I get the knife. He's like, where's the lamb? And Abraham says, God will provide. But Abraham's thinking, it's you. You're the lamb, son. He didn't say that. He's a good father. You're the lamb. That's crazy. And the son, listen, it's not like the son doesn't know what a sacrifice is. He's seen thousands of them. He's seen what they do. They cut the animal, they take the parts, they take the fatty parts, they burn it up, they, you know, they, they cut up the different parts, they burn it up to the Lord. He, he's seen it many, many times. This is their, their tradition. And so he's walking up and he says, okay, you know, oh, hey, where's the lamb? He's no dummy. But you know what he does? He submits. He trusts his father. He lays himself on the altar. Even if, even when Abraham raises his knife, right, he doesn't move. We don't see the story that says, get off me, old man. Right, you crazy sin, old fool. What you doing, man? You know what I mean? There's no language like that. He just submits. He just trusts his dad. You know what I mean? He doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand it but he submits and obeys his father. The leadership, the love, the obedience of the father, the obedience and the submission of the son, and you have an incredible miracle that takes place. This is, this is the prophetic word. Okay, you ready for this one? This is a prophetic word. This is what the word of the Lord gave me. Abraham obeys, right, leads, loves, the son submits and obeys, and a lamb is provided for the sacrifice. Think about this. Obedience, submission, then provision. Okay? Connect, connect the dots. Connect the dots. Obedience, sonship. Obedience, submission, provision. Obedience, submission, provision. See, the ram, the ram is, and is, the Bible is very clear, his horns are caught in the, the bush. He can't escape. The, the, the horns are used for opposition. Is, and these rams, I mean, these, these, these are tough creatures, right? I mean, they're dangerous creatures. These rams use, right, their, 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 their horns to defend to fight, to oppose. This is the prophetic word. Many of you are in the throes of opposition. There is spiritual warfare against you and against your family. You're in this battle. The enemy is opposing you, opposing you, opposing you. Listen, in this season, it's not about spiritual warfare. It's about learning to submit, learning to obey, and then God brings the provision. Whatever warfare is going around you, done. Abraham doesn't do anything. Before, he'd have to fight this ram. You know what I mean? I'm trying to change. Impossible. It's an impossible battle. Instead, God subdues the ram, right? Gets rid of the opposition, gets stuck. And all, all Abraham has to do is just walk up, grab, slit his throat, done. No hardly any work, no fight. 
Do you see that? No fight. God has already fought for you. Why? Because you submitted. You followed his heart. You obeyed. You got out of self. Right? You got out of self. And you submitted to the Lord and to his church. Right? I'm not, I'm not going to be too deep for you guys. Listen, many of you are in the throes of opposition. There is a life that God has for you, but there has been tremendous opposition to those promises. It's not about praying more or fasting more or giving more. It's about obedience and submission. Here's the promise. Walk in sonship and watch God remove the opposition. This is my challenge for you. I'm going to give you a one-year challenge. 2024, 2025. We get back to this space again, right? You know, I'm, I'm talking about this campsite, but we come back, it was April 2025. Learn to walk as a son in this house. Submit yourself to the leaders. Submit yourself, right, to your pastors and your shepherds. I mean, one year, one year challenge. That's all I'm asking you to do. And watch what God does. I tell you, you're going to have some crazy testimonies, man. You're going to be like, we've been trying to do this for years, and you know, and, but I just, this year, I just submitted, I obeyed, and God provided. I've been wanting this job for so long. I, I've been, I, I, yeah. But I, this year, I just obeyed, I submitted, and God provided. It's amazing. Give yourself, walk in sonship in this house and the leaders of this house and watch what God will do in your life in this year. He will remove the opposition and he will provide Jehovah Jireh. Give yourself to the teachings of this house. Submit to them and walk in obedience. And then some people will say, well, peace Sam, right? I only submit to God. I don't submit to people. That's BS, man, right? What does it mean to submit to God? Is that independent of people? Of course it's not. I'll read it again. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy, not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. For one year, walk in obedience and submission, be a son or daughter of the house, and see how your life will change. Walk in sonship at heartbeat. Be fathered by the teachings of this house and learn to walk as a mature son. Right? What does it mean to walk in sonship? It's really simple. Partner with the church. Three things, simple. Your talents, your treasures, and your time. Your talents, serve. Every member a servant. Your treasures, give. Your tithes and offerings. Three, your time. Pray for the church daily. Come out, right, to your prayer meetings. Come out to the retreats, Sunday service, shepherd meetings, right? Your talents, your treasures, and your time. You give yourself to these things and watch what God does in your life this year. Amen? Amen. I'm done. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. Oh, who's this? No, it's for me. Just wanted permission. Oh, okay, okay. Someone got arrested? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Thanks, man. Well, I didn't pay him to, to say that, right? You know that, Sydney. Uh, I also came up and I say, I'm going to, I will start, start with apologizing, being so long and all that, dragging, but spirits will tell me, don't apologize because treat them like son, sons and daughters. They are not your spectator. They are not your audience. They are not here to just like, oh, you have 10 minutes away. Like, uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't get offended because this is, this is a lifetime message. But you know what shocked me right now? I have this goosebump in my arms. Is, what's this year's theme? What's this year's 2024 theme that we've been speaking? Surrender and victorious. Don't you... 
wow. I was just sitting there, oh my gosh, right? You, we didn't even talk about it at all. This is our this is theme, surrender and victories. I challenge you that this is the theme. Okay, I'm not going to, another priest sermon. I'll right, let you go. I'm going to ask Pastor Sam and come and bless us and with a benediction. I'll share more from Melbourne next week, but let's just dig deep into what has been shared to all of us. Sydney people, if you haven't seen it, watched it, please go back to the, all the live stream. I think there's a powerful word. And thank you. Thank you, Ricky. I think that's exactly it. Uh, what I need to hear and what I want them to also hear too as well. All right, how about we give God a big clap offering one last time. <laughs> Church, would you all stand? Would you all stand? And uh, can I invite Pastor Simon to give us one last blessing? Um, okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to give the benediction, but I'd also like to lead you guys in a little ministry time. Okay? Uh, short. Um, and um, so let me do the benediction first. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord, uh, um, I'm reminded, Lord, you gave me a call to preach. Or the passage that you gave me, Lord, was John, Lord, uh, in the book of Revelation, God, where it says that he, the Lord said, eat this. He ate the scroll and he said, Lord, it was sweet in my mouth and it was bitter in my stomach. And I knew that that's kind of the ministry that you would give to me, God. That the hearing of the word, God, would be appealing but then, God, it would go deep into our spirit and cause damage, God. Lord, it would cause a rumbling inside that would crucify the flesh. And so I pray, God, that, and I pray that the word was sweet in our mouth, but now let it be bitter in our stomach. Let it work out with fear and trembling, God. Lord, do your work, Holy Spirit, in our lives, God, and transform our lives in this church. God, we thank you. We love you, God. We bless you. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom from this day forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We can turn the stream off, okay? So this is just for now.